And now to Kenya, where loud bursts of gunfire erupt as Kenyan security forces say they have taken control of a Nairobi shopping mall after a four-day siege. An overnight silence outside the mall was broken at daybreak on Tuesday following a loud burst of gunfire heard coming from inside of the Westgate Mall. Kenya officials have confirmed 62 deaths so far. A small group of survivors escaped the building throughout the day on Monday, but the fate of people listed as missing still unclear. Meanwhile, the Kenyan foreign minister says two or three U.S. citizens and one British citizen were among the attackers. Somalia's al-Shabaab fighters have claimed responsibility for the attack, calling it a retaliation for the presence of Kenyan troops in Somalia. Well, let's switch over to Washington, D.C., joined by a member of Black Autonomy Network Community Organization, Dr. Randy Short. Dr. Short, thanks so much for being with us. Uh, well, a very dramatic situation that has taken place uh, in Kenya. Uh, now, interestingly enough, uh, al-Shabaab has actually uh, taken responsibility, uh, but now actually uh, inside of Kenya officially, they're saying that it's al-Qaeda linked. I, I want to look at uh, the situation of terrorism in general, because there are some that are saying that with the situation with Kenya being involved in Somalia, Somalia that this is helping to give rise to this type of terrorist acts uh, inside of Somalia and other places. Your take, sir? Well, my take is uh, yes, yes, and yes. Uh, the Kenyans who are helping to implement the United States policy in Somalia, along with Ethiopia, have outraged the people of Somalia. There have been a lot of atrocities against the Somali people that have not been reported in the Western media. In addition to that, the timing of this uh, situation in, uh, in, in Kenya, it's interesting that now that the Obama policy has failed, in Syria with the same al-Qaeda people that it funds, they find another place for this to explode, and then all of a sudden al-Qaeda is on the front pages of the papers again. And I have a dear friend who works in the Somali government. It's interesting that the violence in Somalia subsided largely once the violence accelerated in Syria. So what causes this? Does al-Qaeda function as a part of American international policy? In addition to that, Somalia's waterways have been violated, with pollution being dumped there, with their fish being stolen, with Somali nationals being tortured on ghost ships, with Somalis being tortured in Kenya and in Djibouti. Not to mention that Kenya has land that belongs to the Somalis. The Djibouti was ethnically cleansed by the French of Somalis. The Somali people have been divided by different international powers, and many Somali people are angry about it, and legitimately so. It doesn't justify violence against civilians who ever did it in, 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 in Nairobi. However, the Somali people have been persecuted. Their country is rich in oil, and people want to steal it from them. This is the same thing that happens over and over and over again, and yet they vilify whole peoples without explaining. Things like American soldiers raping Somali children, which led to the fight that happened in 1992-93, or Canadian soldiers killing Somali uh, uh, teenagers, or for that matter, civilians and refugees being murdered when this last famine took place and when they got rid of the Islamic courts. No one seems to want to see that the Somalis are people. They've been colonized and victimized by external forces. They've tried to have their own society, and yet they've had either dictators like Siad Bar, supported by the East and the West, the former Soviet Union, and the United States. The Somali people are tired. So these individuals who've done whatever they've done, whether they al-Qaeda or al-Shabaab, in reality, this violence wouldn't take place if development and peace were the international thrust of the world powers versus war. Okay. Dr. Short, I, I want to pick up on something you've just, you just mentioned um, as for as perhaps al-Qaeda uh, forming a, a part of Western 
foreign policy. We see on the one hand, for example, in a place like Syria, that the United States are actually supporting al-Qaeda link groups. We see in Afghanistan, for example, now that the West wants, they want to talk uh, to the Taliban. So we see different policies in different places. Uh, tell me how that is affecting uh, not only this situation, but, but in general in the world when we see this sort of up and down with terrorism. On the one hand, the United States many times actually uh, they are supporting terrorists. On the other hand, uh, depending on the country, depending on the place and timing, uh, they verbally at least condemned it. You left out Libya, uh, so you had the Al Qaeda there. Uh, the uh, this group, so-called Al Qaeda, is a protean force that seems to serve the interest of the fraudy Arabia, of the United States, and Great Britain, and their great game of of maintaining control and supporting Israel. It 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 doesn't make any other sense. Where I mean, you have Al Qaeda in. Mali, then you don't. You have them in Algeria, then you don't. If Bouteflika wants to use them in Algeria, then they have Al Qaeda, then they don't have it. It, it seems to serve ever since this uh, former president, who should be in the docket at, and, and the ICC, uh, President Bush came up with this idea that you're either for us or against us. Everyone is now using this terrorism or Al Qaeda to justify domestic repression or fighting against groups that may be legitimately calling for liberation or more justice. Okay. So, uh, what is Al Qaeda? All right. Well, thank you so much. So, unfortunately, we're out of time. Appreciate you being with us, Dr. Randy Shore from the Black Autonomy Network Community Organization, Washington, D.C.